and allergies. I don't have COVID. Went to the doctor yesterday to make sure I said, well, I doctor, I got to get up and talk in front of these people tomorrow. And if I start coughing or I sound crazy, I don't want people to say, oh, she's sick, sick, sick. So allergies, sinuses, and all that stuff. So like I said, please pray for me. Pray for my healing. The lesson this morning is coming from Luke, the Lord's Supper. Focal verses, Luke 22, 7 through 23, aim for a change. By the end of the lesson, we will explore the principles behind the Lord's Supper, commit to participate in the Lord's Supper as Jesus would have believers to do, and feel motivated to teach someone else about the importance of the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings, for your love, your grace and mercy, for providing us a way for a second chance, for eternal life, for salvation through the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, Lord, and open our eyes so that we may see our ears so that we may hear, and give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Help us to receive your word and apply it and put it into practice so that we can tell somebody about what communion, what the Lord's Supper really is. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, Father, for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord's Supper, communion, we call it communion. And for the church, for us, we have um, two sacraments, baptism and communion, the Lord's Supper. So Jesus is celebrating his last meal. This is his final meal with his apostles, his disciples, and they're getting ready to sit down to eat that Passover meal. The Passover meal was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was at the same time. And when we talk about the Last Supper, it's that Passover meal with the disciples. He told the disciples to go and prepare a meal, get the Passover ready. They were out at the Mount of Olives, and they were getting ready to come and eat the meal. So he sent Peter and John out to go and prepare, and we'll get into that. Let's go ahead and read. I'm going to read the in focus first, verses and we'll move into the lesson. Now, you know how we start. I like to start with the scripture, and the scripture, Exodus chapter 12, is gonna be a little long, so I'll try to read as fast as I can. If y'all can't hear me, somebody raise your, your finger or something to let me know I need to speak a little louder, okay? I don't wanna trip up over this cord. In focus, Louise was a wonderful woman who left a godly legacy, not only with her family, but also among the church relatives. No wonder hundreds of people turned out for her homegoing service, even though it was a hot and humid day. After the service and burial, people gathered for the fellowship meal in the church banquet hall to share fond memories of Louise. Pa the pastor was surprised at how far Louise's family had come for her funeral. Louise's kinfolk lived in Los Angeles, Chicago, Baltimore, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and Montgomery, Alabama. Everyone is here, said, said one of Louise's distant cousins, but I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Louise was so very special, and I, would, I wanted to show her and the rest of the family what she meant to me. A church member chimed in. Yes, Louise was a stalwart of our church, and it was only fitting to share this special occasion with her family and friends. Special occasions are for special people who have made a lasting impact on our lives. We want to demonstrate how much we love and appreciate them, and one of the ways is to do that is a fellowship meal to honor them. In today's lesson, we learned that there is something wonderful about, having, about sharing a meal together. In fact, in many countries, the dinner table is synonymous with brotherly love and fellowship. So the Last Supper, that last meal that Jesus was having with the apostle, his disciples, giving him his last words and last instructions, and they were coming together, so it said sharing a meal was that fellowship. And I don't know, I think we've gotten away from it a lot where people have, that's my phone?
the meal, dinner, dinner meal, dinner table where families come together and just fellowship and talk and communicate with one another, establish that bond or that relationship. And I don't know if we all do it. I know we've not done it in a while. We don't get together and sit at the dinner table a lot. I know holidays, especially pre-COVID, holidays come together and everybody would sit down and have that meal. I don't know if we've gone back to it yet. I think some people do. But just coming together as a fellowship and showing love and appreciation for one another. It's that last meal Jesus was having with his disciple, the Lord's Supper, that last meal. And that's when it was instituted. The keep in mind verse. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This cup is a new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, and an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The Passover, the unleavened bread, that was done when the children of Israel were in Egypt, and it was time for God to bring them out, out of Egypt, to free them from slavery. And so the Passover meal was celebrated where the blood of the angel of death was going to pass over the houses. He was going to go and kill the first, the sons, the males, the males, human and animals. And so God told Moses to tell the people, a blood of a lamb, a year old, without blemish, spotless. When you kill the, the lamb, put the blood over the doorposts and over the lentils. So when the angel of death came through, the angel of death would pass by, Passover meal. And they were going to celebrate this meal, the meal that they ate, then they had to use unleavened bread. Because when God moved and when God told them it was time to get up and go, they had to be ready to go. So don't, when you eat unleavened bread, no bread with yeast unleaving. You had to move. Be ready dressed, almost dressed, have your stick, everything close by, because when it was time to go, you had to get up and get, get out. So, unleaving bread and the Passover, the blood. And one thing that's awesome about God, when you see blood, you hear about blood covenants, and people, I used to watch these western movies, and the Indian and the, and, and the Caucasian man used to make these covenants, and they would cut their arms and do the blood thing. Y'all remember that? So blood, God ratifies things with the blood. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden where God killed an animal and made the clothing for Adam and Eve. The blood had to be shed, blood had to be shed. And so when we think about the blood covenant, Jesus said, this is a new covenant that I'm making. Jesus was the final, the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Nothing else can take his place, nothing, no one, he was spotless. He was perfect. He came from God, the Son of God, perfect, spotless. He came to sacrifice his life for us so that we may have eternal life, a second chance, forgiveness, salvation. Restore us, redeem us back into good standing, back into relationship with God the Father because sin separates us from God. And remember, it was a continually, continually, over and over again, the children of Israel. And so, God sent his son, the final, the ultimate, the perfect sacrifice. Didn't need anything else. His blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Whole again? Nothing but the blood. You know, you think about it, and, and I heard somebody say when, when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we're covered with his blood, the Father sees his blood on us. We're covered. And you hear people always say, plead the blood, plead the blood. The blood of Jesus. There is power. That dunamis, that power. But you have to allow him to have his way. Submit to him. Let him have his way. And know that when you're covered by the blood. Now, God didn't say we won't go through those trials and tribulations, y'all. He didn't say we won't go through. 
but he's bring us through. He cover us with that blood and keep us. The strength that we need to go through those trials and tribulations, he promised never to leave nor forsake us. He'd be there with us. So when we plead that blood and trust on him, trust in him or stand on his, stand on his word, he got you. And it's not always easy, y'all. Y'all know. It's not always easy. But he got you and he's covering you and he's carrying you and you call on Jesus. Because Jesus went through it for us. He is that sacrificial lamb. He did it all. And what makes it so awesome about God and Jesus was John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He did it for everybody, not just for certain people. You're not just for the person down the block. You know, and that person in Israel. He did it for all of us who would come to the son. And guess what? There is no other way to the father except through the son. Jesus paid it all. We have to go through Jesus. So you see, Jesus was a prophet. He was a good person. He was a rabbi, teacher. If, if that's it, it's missed. You missed it. There's no other way into heaven. There was no other way through salvation except through Jesus Christ, the son, who hung and died, rose on the third day, all power in his hand, the blood, his blood, pure blood, sacrificial blood, ultimate blood. No other way to the Father except through the Son. That's how much God loves us. Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us. Thank you, God. He loved us like that. And he continues to love us, sits on the right hand of the Father making intercession. He's our mediator sitting there. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. On the right hand of the Father looking out for us. What kind of love is that? Isn't that awesome? Awesome. Okay, y'all. Okay. We haven't even gotten into the um, scripture yet. Okay, I'm going to try to read Exodus chapter 12. Y'all bear with me. I'll try to go as fast as I can, and then we will get into the reading, okay? That's all right? Y'all tell me something. Okay. Let me see how well I can read. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall, oh, hold on, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month for you. Speak unto all the children of Israel, saying to them, saying, to, in, the, saying in the month, tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their father, a lamb for an house. And I'm not reading this very well, am I? <laughs> okay, bear with me. I might have to take my glasses off. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house they're going to share the lamb according to the number of the, how, the souls. Every man according to the, his eat, of his eating shall make your, oh gosh, let me take, I'm going to take my glasses off. Y'all bear with me, okay? Okay, and if not, we'll skip that part. Okay, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next into, unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall make and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses where they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh and that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with his printiness thereof. And ye shall let nothing remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And this shall ye eat it with your, home, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, 
and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment of the Lord. And the blood shall be for you, for a token, to you for a token, upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, and it shall, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. I'm going to stop there. That's when it was instituted. It told Moses the Passover, unleavened bread. So then this is where Jesus and his disciples are coming. They're getting ready for the Passover. Jesus is getting ready to celebrate his last meal. So this is where we are, and this is where we're starting in the reading. Focal verse. Luke 22, 7. Then came the day at unleavened bread when the Passover meal must be killed. So we just talked about the Passover, the institution of that, and what should happen. They were making their way to Jerusalem, and he told Peter and John, we're going to get into that, to get ready the Passover meal. Any questions about the Passover or unleavened bread? We're moving on. Now, remember, if y'all got a question, y'all stop me. And raise your hand high this time if y'all got something to tell me. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. Okay. And he said, and he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Peter and John, his inner circle. Remember, his inner circle was Peter, James, and John. So he was sending his trusted, his trusted closest friends to go and prepare the Passover meal. And they said unto him, where, with, where, will, though, mm, where will thou that we prepare? Where should we go? Where are we going to go, Jesus? You're telling us to go and get ready for this Passover meal. Where is it that you want us to go? So Jesus said, and he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there ye shall a man meet, meet you, bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entereth in. So now, Jesus told him, go ahead, go in the city, you're going to see this man with a pitcher of water. And remember, you think Jesus has already told this man I'm coming? They're coming and be ready. Or remember, Jesus is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So he knows everything. And this, one of the write ups saying, one of the readings said, he could probably, Jesus could already see that man because Jesus could be everywhere at the same time and he could see all things. But he told them, he told Peter and John to go, and he didn't really tell them any, too much of anything because remember, the religious leaders wanted to kill him, they were ready to crucify him. So he didn't want this last meal to be interrupted. He didn't want anything to stop that because that meal had to go into place. It had to happen because this is where communion started. So he didn't tell too much information. So remember, Judas was there to betray him. So if he had gotten out, if he had gotten out ahead of time where it was going to be, he didn't want anybody to come and interrupt that and stop that because remember, the word had to go forth. Scripture had to be fulfilled. So now, the man that was in the street, remember, Peter and John said, well, how are we going to know, they're thinking, how are we going to know this man? Who is this man? Remember, back then, women usually carried pictures of water. Men didn't usually carry pictures of water. So that was another thing. Okay? Verse 14, where am I? 11. Y'all, my sight is not good today. And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, the master, rabbi, teacher, saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Where is it? Where, where do we need to go? That's what Jesus told them. And once they got there, they would know exactly what to do. Okay? Let me go to my Bible, because my Bible has larger words, okay? Y'all bear with me. There we go. Verse 12. 
and ye shall, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished there. Make ready. He's going to show you what to do. He's going to show you where to go. This is where you need to go. This is what you need to do. Okay? Any questions? Y'all, I need some tissue. I'm sorry. Anybody, y'all quiet, man, help me out. What did y'all think about what I said in reference to how did they know that that was the man that Jesus um, had spoken to? Any comments on that one? Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Okay. Let's move on. So he said, and he, you're going to show you this upper room, this guest room, where you're supposed to go. He's going to show you this guest room, this upper room, where you're supposed to go. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, so they went, and they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready for the Passover. We talked about preparation of killing the lamb. So they made ready to kill the lamb and get the room ready for them to eat the final meal, that last supper. Okay. And he said, and when the hour was come, He sat down and the 12 apostles with him. This is the time then the disciples were officially called the apostles. So this is when the name change took place. They were called the apostles the first time. Okay? Four. And he said unto them with desire... I have desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. He's burdened. He knew that this is his last time that he was going to be with the disciples, apostles. He was going to go to the cross and he was going to suffer and die. So he was telling them his inner feelings, what was going on with him. Like I said, he was going to, he was, this was a teaching moment. He was going to teach them, instruct them, tell them what he needed them for, for, him to tell, for them to tell the world. But then this was a teaching moment where he knew he wasn't going to be with his close friends, his students. He wasn't going to be with them anymore after this. So he was burned. He said, with a desire, uh, with a desire, I'm eager, I'm anxious but not necessarily anxious, but I'm eager to tell you, to spend this time with you right now because we're not going to be together like this again, and he's going to tell them when. Okay, y'all tell me how much time, okay? When he'll be able to spend that time with them again, with desire, before I suffer. I was looking for, I'm looking forward to spend this last supper, this last meal with you because he's going to die. But, of course, you know, he rose. But, you know, you sp he spent three years with them, teaching, talking. And then, remember, there were times that Jesus was talking to them and telling them things. They didn't really understand it. And he knew, like, even this time here, they didn't really understand everything. But if you love and sleep with somebody for three years, you develop a relationship. So he said, with desire. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. This is it. You heard what he said. This is his final instruction. This is it. The last time we're going to be together as a group. Final instructions. Okay. And he said, with desire. Mm. Okay. 
So then he goes and he says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until I fulfill in the, in the kingdom of God. Did I skip a verse? No, that's it. So until I come into the kingdom of God, the next time he's with them, the millennial kingdom and the kingdom of God in, in heaven, we're not going to eat together like this, have this meal. This, this man talks about the marriage of the lamb, the marriage of the bride, coming together with you to eat this meal. This is the last time. We're not going to have this fellowship together again like this. So he said, this, this, is not, this is it for right now. Okay, any questions so far? And he took the bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, and I'll come back to bring this all together. How much time I got, y'all? What time is it? Okay. Likewise, also, he took the cup after supper. Did I, help me if I skipped a verse, saying, 19, okay, and he took bread and he gave thanks and said, and he break it and he gave unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. I thought I read that. Likewise, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Corinthians chapter 11. Um, he took the bread. One thing Jesus did that was different, it says he took bread and gave thanks. According to tradition, Jewish tradition, the thanks was given by the head of the household last, not at the be beginning. The blessing and the grace was given at the end of the meal, not at the beginning of the meal. Jesus instituted something that was different. He did it first. And so remember, we're supposed, Jesus set the example, we're supposed to follow Jesus, right? When Jesus sat down to eat, what did Jesus do? What did he do? He gave thanks and he did it when? In the beginning, first. When you sit down to eat your food, when are you supposed to say your grace? Yeah. At the beginning. In the beginning. When you go to eat your food, first, in the beginning, your blessings. Your blessing, you say it first. He set a precedence. Remember, Jesus was the ultimate example. He said it first. So he changed things right there. And then also he said, this is my body for the bread. And then for the wine, he said, this is my blood. Remember? Who was on the cross? Who, who, who died? Oh, I got to come up because y'all can't hear me, right? I'm sorry. Y'all are supposed to wave your hand and say, I can't hear. Okay. So, his body was the bread. This was an unusual thing. This is where he instituted our communion, the Last Supper, where he said, he let them know, this is different. This is something new. This is my body. I hung on the cross. I'm going to hang on the cross. For us, for us, I hung on the cross. But for them, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die for you. My blood, my blood shed for you. And when we think about it, y'all remember the movie, The Passion of Christ? Y'all ever, did everybody see that movie? And what, what he, what they shot, and they said the movie before they told you to watch it, and when you looked, before you looked at it, it was going to be graphic. Y'all remember how graphic that movie was? They said it was real bloody. I never watched it. I, I couldn't. I couldn't watch it. Because they said it was very graphic. And so, the blood, the bread, his body, do this in remembrance of me. What I'm going to go through and ultimately die for you, he died for us. Do this in remembrance of me every time we take communion. And also remember, communion 
when you take communion, they, they go back and forth. You're supposed to do it every, way, every week, every month, or however you want to do it. And the key thing is to remember, Jesus said, do it. Do it. Don't argue and say, oh, they're wrong because they only take it once a month. He doesn't want us to get caught up on things like that. He wants us to do it in remembrance for what he did for us. It's not, hmm? That's why we take it. Yes, in remembrance of him, what he did. Isn't it on the table here? Do this in remembrance of me, of what I did, of your Lord and Savior. I died for you, but I got up with all power in my hand. I did it. And remember, Jesus is humble. I'm just saying it like that because Jesus, Jesus is humble. So he shed his blood for us. He loved us so much. Do this in remembrance of me, of what I did. I died so you can have, and I can have a second chance. I can have salvation. We can have eternal life. We can have forgiveness. We can love our enemies in spite of everything. Because that's the example Jesus set, to love everyone in spite of it all. So do this in remembrance of me. When we sit and we take that communion, remember why you're taking it. This is what the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. In remembrance of me of what I've done, what he's about to do. Always be thankful, thankful. He knew he was getting ready to die. He said, Grace, okay? This doing remembrance of me. I did this for you, okay? Yeah. Yes, sir, go ahead. So, so then what do you say to people that say, well, because I did this Saturday night or I did this Friday night, I don't feel good about taking communion on Sunday. But we do communion in remembrance of him. So what do you say to them? That, that's a personal thing, but the thing is when you take communion, when you come to God, and well, I have to be honest and straightforward with you. When you come to God's house, you should have a certain mindset. Your mind should be certain, focused on what God would have you to feed on. Because I said, this is a feeding place. This is where we get our food. When you read your Bible every day, that's your food. So that's where we get our strength to continue to go on and on. When you walk into these doors, your mind, your heart should be a certain place. And people should, I, I'm just saying, me personally, don't come into God's house all kinds of ways. Because God wants your mind. Well, I don't mean to say it like that because he wants everybody to come. So I'm, I don't mean it to sound like that. But when we come and we say we're believers and we're Christians, you come with the right mindset to receive, to get what God would have you to get. Because we go through so much different trials and tribulations or different things in this world on our daily journey. So when we come in, remember to read your Bible every day because you're going to be, you have to be fed and filled up. But when you come in, there's other things that God may have somebody to say to you, the pastor, somebody sitting next to you, the song, a deacon, somebody that you need to hear so when you go to work or you go out in the world, there's something God might have you to do. So when you walk into the doors, but you should, should have a certain mindset. And if you feel that you shouldn't take it, then don't take it. See, God deals with us individually, okay? God knows your heart and your mind. And I, I was reading something, and it said something about... Um, Oh, you shouldn't take communion at home. And I was like, it said, do this in remembrance of me. So if you're sick at home or you're not feeling, you know, you can't get to church that Sunday and that's your communion Sunday, you should be able to take communion anytime you want to because you were not able to get to the church on the communion Sunday. What y'all think about that? If somebody's at home, they're not supposed to have communion at home? So it was, it was like, I don't know, if, I don't agree with that. So it, it's, um, it's between you and God, but when you come into the house of God, your mind should be a certain way. You should be ready to receive that communion. Because there's always preparation. But don't, isn't there a prayer you pray before you take the communion? And one thing we have to remember, we ask God to search our hearts. That's in the scripture. Search our hearts. Now, if your heart's not, if you know your heart's not right, if you know your heart's not right, then maybe you need to think about. Now, I'm just saying that. But before you take that communion, 
Communion causes you to stop and think. This is what Jesus, this is what Jesus, what Jesus did for me. Jesus shed his blood for me. Jesus loves me so much. And it calls you to reflect and look at self and say, Lord, am I living the life you would have me to live? Am I doing what you want me to do? Did I do everything that I should have done this week, this past week? And Father, if I have not, search me, God, forgive me, God, and repent. And you do that, you can take that communion. If you do that, you could take that communion. Because if he, he said, if you know you did something, then you, pay, you pray and ask God for forgiveness and repent right then and there. Remember, God doesn't hold things against us. He will not hold it because that's why Jesus died on the cross. He will not hold what you did last night against you if you repent. You can be sitting right there. So if you went out last night and did something you weren't supposed to do and you come to God and you ask forgiveness and created me a clean heart, but forgive me, God, I was wrong, I rep and you're sincere, sincere. You must come to God in sincerity. So if you sit there before you take that communion and you repent and ask God for forgiveness and you truly mean it from the heart, why can't you take that? What do you think? Mm -hmm. what? You have to understand the reason why you're taking the communion. Right. You're not taking it because what you did last week or last month. You have to understand the reason why you're doing it. And remembrance of what Jesus did for us. The new covenant, his blood, his body for Jesus. Your, your relationship with Jesus, your covenant with God. Jesus brought you into relation, renewed salvation deliverance, eternal life, forgiveness with Jesus. So we have to understand when before we take that communion why we're doing it. And it's a deep reflection because if you think about communion and thinking about Jesus and what he's done for us, oh my God. Can we ever thank Jesus enough? Think about just being here right now is a blessing. And and a psalm on here, I'm struggling reading. I got to get my eyes checked, y'all. Y'all should talk, y'all can tell me about myself. It's okay. I got to get my eyes checked. I know the doctor told me, and I, I think I'm young about cataracts, getting the cataracts and all that stuff. But I think I'm young, okay? So, okay, thank you. But when we come into the house of God, remember, we have to be right. But God has blessed us. So when you sit to take that communion, and I think pastor or something, I don't know if Reverend Gaston, pastor, pastor Murrow say, it's not time for conversation. You know, it's time to reflect. They're sitting at the table. It's time to reflect. When you sit there before you take that communion, thinking about what Jesus has done, his body, his blood, what he went through, the beating, the spitting. Imagine somebody spitting on you. How do you feel somebody spit on you? Y'all be ready to fight, right? Be real. Spitting. They mocked him. He died on the cross. Father, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Now, when we're sitting here about to take that communion, thinking about all that Jesus went through for us. Oh, God, think about everything that he went through for you and me. And we're about to take that communion. It says, do this, do this in remembrance of me, of what I did, or what I am still doing, because we're here today, in a sound mind. You were able to walk in, pushed in, however you got in, drive in, you still got a home, Still can get up, have a way you can do it, but you're still here. And it was nobody but God. Thank God for Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He shed it. He did it. And you know what we have to remember? As we sit there and we're about to take that communion, guess what, y'all? It wasn't anything that we did. It was because God sent his son 
because Jesus loved us so much, he was willing to die for us. He didn't have to do it, but he did. What kind of love is that? You know, we act up all the time. You know, we don't listen. We're stubborn. We don't do the right thing all the time. God will tell us to do something, and we don't do it when we're supposed to. Sometimes we try to do it our way. And God continues to bless us and keep us and forgive us continually. He continues to keep us day by day. Jesus loves us that much. This do in remembrance of me, my body and my blood. I did it. And like I said, I'm saying it like I'm saying it. Y'all know he's not. He's, he's humble. He was humble. He is humble, sitting in the right hand of, father, of the Father, still praying for us, still, still telling the Holy Spirit, because once we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and allow the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within, he continues to speak through the Spirit through us, to us to say, okay, you're about to do something wrong. Uh-uh, don't do it. What you said was not right. Or what you're about to say is not right. Or even if you said it or did it, he speaks to us and he lets us know, don't do it. But when we do it wrong, guess what he does? Forgives us. Over and over and over again. So y'all are here looking wonderful, looking beautiful. And it's like, oh, don't think you got here by yourself. Who got you here? Hmm. Stop and think about when, and I, I, it's always awesome and amazing when I think about that cross, how much Jesus loved us. It makes you, it's humbling, y'all, to think about all he did. He shed his life for us so that we may be here right now. He loved us so much, he could have said, you know, Father, because remember when he went to the garden of Gethsemane, he went to pray and he left the disciples. It was a Peter, James, and John. He left them over there. Said he went a little farther to pray. And he prayed and he said, Father, let this cup pass by me. He went three times to pray. And then he finally said, you know, he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He could have said, you know, God, Father, I'm not doing this because, you know, and God, because he's omniscient, he knows everything. He knew that there's people that still don't want to serve him, don't love him, don't care about him. He knew that we were going to be disobedient and all, didn't always do the right and don't always do the right thing. But he continually loves us and take care of the, takes care of us. He could have said, oh, no, God, no, not these people, not them. No, we're going to try a different people. He didn't say that. Nevertheless, and it was the religious people, remember? It was the religious people, you know, us, Christians, so-called Christians, that crucified him. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So he did it. So when we go to sit down, I got a, I got a clock keeper in front of me. When we go to sit down and take that communion, y'all, when we stop to think, we stop to think before we take it. So it's a moment of reflection to think about, oh, how good God has been to us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I'm here. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, if it wasn't for you on my side, where would I be? God, you're keeping me, you kept me, and Lord, I thank you. Your body and your blood, Last Supper, Communion. God, I could never thank you enough for all that you've done for me. Thank you. Lord, another chance. Thank you. Lord, you did it again. Thank you. Lord, you know what happened. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me get to the end because I'm, I'm running out of time. I got five minutes, y'all. Okay, but verse 21, the New Testament of his blood. New Testament. We're, we're living in that, two test, that new covenant because of his blood, his body, dying on the cross, and then he got up. Resurrection. Resurrection. 
he got up. He didn't stay in the grave, y'all. So we got another chance. We got eternal life because he got up and he got up with all power in his hand. That's why we can go every day and sometimes don't know how we're going to make it through. But if we say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, keep me. Lord, show me what to do. Lord, how do I handle this situation? Call on him. And I talked to him. She just got here later. Y'all remember, plead the blood. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, help me. Jesus, show me the way because I don't know how to fix this situation. And guess what? It may not be a situation. Excuse me, a situation you need to fix. He's going to have to be the one to come and fix the situation. You have to let go and let God. Just stand still and see. The, remember he told Moses? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You let God work it out. Because sometimes we try to help God and guess what we do? We mess up. Mess up. We mess up, okay? So it's up to us to say, God, I'm going to cast all my cares on you. Trust you to fix the situation because I don't know what or how to do it. Let go and let God. Let him work it out. He'll do it. Trust him. Trust Jesus because he did it all for us. Okay, so now it says, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but with, but, mm, but woe unto the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. He warned them, he let them know that um, there's somebody sitting at this table that's going to betray me. Somebody sitting with me that's been with me for three years. Somebody in this crowd that's going to, sitting at this table is going to betray me. And everybody started inquiring. My time is up, y'all. I got two minutes. Okay, deacons, I got two minutes. Somebody's at this table is going to betray me. You know, you ever had a good friend and you thought it was a good friend? Somebody you all used to hang around with, y'all y'all work together, whatever. That person betrayed you. Was that me or them? That person betrayed you. I know you, you were upset, weren't you? You were mad. But Jesus wasn't like that. Remember, the scripture had to be fulfilled. So Judas was betraying him, and it said that, he said that so that maybe Judas would repent, to give him an opportunity to repent. But remember, scripture had to be fulfilled that he was going to be betrayed. So when I read that, it was like, well, an opportunity for Judas to repent, well, maybe, you know God always has a plan. So if Judas had repented, then maybe somebody, it would, God would have had somebody else to do it. But the opportunity was there for Judas to repent. And then the disciples started to say, well, who is it, Lord? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? They wanted to know. It was not their time to know. They would find out later. So the lesson is talking about the Last Supper, the institution of the Last Supper communion. So when we do that, we take it in remembrance of Jesus' body, the bread, Jesus' blood, the wine. So remember, before you take communion, because the deacon asked the question, before you take communion, we're supposed to stop and think about Jesus, all he did for us, what he's done for us, what he's still doing for us. Think about Jesus. Any questions, comments? Thank you all for your attention. God bless you. Oh, lesson for next week, y'all. John, the living word, focal verses, John 21 through 10 and 19 through 20. Let's close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Thank you for dying on an old rugged cross so that we may have another chance, so that we may have eternal life, so that we may be redeemed, restored, renewed, forgiven, God. We thank you for loving us so much, Father. Thank you for all you've done, you're doing, you will do. And Lord, before we sit down to that communion, help us to reflect and look at self. But first of all, we look at you. Look at the cross. Remember what you did. But not the cross, Lord, because you got up and you have all power in your hand. 
You're God of grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and keeping us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are about to have our devotion, start our devotion, and we pray and hope that you will join in with us. But before we go in on, into our devotion, we got a few names that we want to call that are in prayer for, for prayer. And uh, we know that the prayer of the righteous availeth much. So remember, the, when you bow, say a few words in prayer for these, these members. And I know there's probably many more, but there's just a few names that um, I will be calling. Uh, Sister Candace Ackerman, she asking for prayer. Sister Donna Brown asking for prayer. Sister Barbara McDaniel, asking for prayer. Deacon Elijah Rivers and Deacon Stacy Manigo, they are asking for prayer. And their death in the family, uh, we are asking for prayer for these family members, uh, the Williams family and the uh, Washington family. Keep these members in, in your prayer. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, I'm crying, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Once again, Heavenly Father, we come in your holy and your divine presence. Master, we want to give you thanks for the many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, even for watching over us all night long and 
touching us this morning, Master, with the finger of love, waking us up in our right mind. Blood is still warm, running warm through our vein, and our dying soul have another chance. Pray now, Master, your forgiveness. Lord, for we realize that all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And Lord, we even asking your forgiveness, Lord, because we, a lot of things that we should have done, Master, that we didn't do. And we ask in you, Master, to forgive us for our many, many sin. Pray now, Heavenly Father, that you will remember this church as a whole, Master. First Baptist as a whole, dear Father. Pray that you will just, just continue to be with us and to guide us and to keep us in, in your ways and keep us in your word. Bless us, O Heavenly Father, as only you can. And dear Lord, there were a few names called this morning, Father. Pray that you touch, Lord. Anoint them, O Heavenly Father, from the crown of the head to the soles of their feet, Lord. Master, just do the good that you see them standing in need of. And, and dear Father, as we come, Lord, remember our pastor in his absence, Master. Keep him in your kind and keep him care. Continue to guide him and bless him and lead him, Master, that he may be able to lead us in the way that you want him to lead us, Father. Bless this nation as a whole, Master, for we need you now, Master, more than ever before. There's so much going on in this world. Father, I pray that you just look down upon this nation with the eye of pity and the heart of a most tender compassion, Master. And Lord, just bless us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I am on. Oh, I didn't see you back there. Good morning, church. <laughs> we thank you. Uh, thank Deacon, John, uh, Deacon Cromwell for that prayer. Uh, we bring you devotion this morning. Deacon Josiah Cromwell, Deacon Lenny Moore, and myself, Deacon Roy Small Sr. The scripture will be coming from Psalms. Psalms 24, and it reads as follow. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. The world and all its people belongs to him. For he lays the earth foundation on the sea and built it on the ocean depth. How may, who may climb the mountains of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure and who do not worship idle and evil and tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a righteous relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient door, and let the king of the glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord in the middle and in vital. Open up ancient gate, open up ancient door, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven armies. He is the king of glory. May these words be a blessing to the reader and the, hear, and the reader of thereof. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Hallelujah, oh, since I laid my burden down, oh, my friends don't treat me, yes, sir, like they used to, oh, since I 
Testing one, two. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to come before you with a couple of songs. So we encourage you to join in with us as we worship the Lord.
God's face. I believe I'll run on, run, run on, and see, see what the end is going to be. Oh, come on and run on. Jesus walking with me. Just hold my hand, hold my hand, guide my feet. Yes, Lord, just guide my feet, guide my feet, just guide my feet. Yes, Lord, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? To run on, to see what the end is going to be. See what the end is going to be. Oh, come on, just come on, just run, 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 run. just run, 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 run. Come on and run. Yes, sir. And see what the end, what the end is gonna be. And every day, every day, I'm making preparation to see God's face. I believe I'll run on, yeah, on, and see, see what the end is gonna be. Is that all right? Is that all right? Yeah. Can you feel God moving? Yeah. Can you feel God moving? Yeah. Church, can you feel? God moving. Yeah. Oh, I feel, I feel him moving in my soul. I think we're going to sing that again. Can you feel yeah. God moving? Yeah. Can I get a witness that can you feel God? Can you feel God moving? Yeah. I feel, I feel Him moving in my soul. Now come on. Can you feel God moving? Yeah. Can you feel God moving? Yeah. When he touched me, my hands look new. Some say when he touched me, my feet did too. Some say when he touched me, I started to shout. But ever since he touched me, he set my soul on fire. Can you feel God moving? Can you feel God moving? 
when we enter into the house. Uh, we don't have to warm, the, warm it up in order to praise God. But once somebody open their mouth and begin to sing songs of Zion, glory to God, we feel him moving. The spirit of the Lord know that it's welcome in this place. Uh, hallelujah. We thank him this morning. We thank him this morning. We thank him. We thank him. Because we know that without him, we could do nothing. Without him, we would not be here this morning. Without him, the devil could have trashed us all over the place. But with God, we are mighty warriors. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. With God, we could stand strong. Praise God from whom all blessings stand. Blessings flow. Hallelujah, Jesus.
adore you this morning. We give thanks from the depths of our souls. Our heart rejoices in you today, Lord. Our heart just give you praises, Lord. Oh, Jesus, because we know, we know that without you, we could do nothing. We would be like a ship without a sail. And so, because we are so grateful, we glorify you this day in this house uh, and we open up our hearts uh, that you may do whatever you would like to do today Lord uh, we ask that you just have your way Jesus uh, move Lord from the choir stand to the door hallelujah all over Lord let your anointing uh, be felt uh, in this place today uh, this service is not our service uh, but it's your service uh, do what you want to do. And hallelujah, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for our pastor today in his absent, Lord. Keep him, Lord. Keep him, Lord. Cover him, Lord. And his whole family. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Scripture reading for this morning, Psalms 34, the 34, 34th Psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were enlightened, and their face were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped around about them that fear him and delivered them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed is the man that trusted in him. for being here. Thank God for each and every one of you today. Praise the Lord. No matter what we're going through, we are here. And we are giving God his due praises. Because as we praise God, we know that when praises go up, amen, blessings come down. So we're going to give God his due today. Uh, the pastor is not here, but he do want to thank each and every one of you who participated in the tea, um, the tea on yesterday. It was really, really good.
everything was decorated so nicely, and we had more food that, that we can eat. It was just a blessed fellowship together, and I thank the Lord for it. <coughs> also, um, we're going to have three people to come up today. Sister Terry Gilliard, she's going to briefly tell us about the Ministry Expo. And then we're going to have uh, Sister Lillian Pinckney, who's going to tell us about the blast from the past. And then our U.S. Democratic candidate, Michael B. Moore, will then come before you. Good morning, I'm Terry Gilliard, and next Sunday, April 28th, immediately following service, our, we will have a ministry expo. Think of this as a job fair for the Lord. This will be the perfect opportunity for new and existing members who are currently not serving in any ministry, and also for those who are assigned to a ministry but are not active. You know who you are, and your team members know who you are as well, to seek out a ministry and to become active. We have many ministries that are inactive or that lack the participation needed to be fully successful and functional. These ministries are important. If we all do our part, we, the work will be spread out. For example, hospitality, we need uh, three people per Sunday. Um, think about that. If we have 78 people that volunteer, that's only two times per year that you'd have to serve. Another ministry that is inactive is the nursery. If we get 130 people, that might sound like a lot, but we have over 1,500 members. And if, say, 50% of those people are either too young or physically unable to serve in that capacity, um, we would just need 130 people, and that would still be only serving twice per year. That's not much to ask. Each ministry will have a display table where you can meet the ministry president or a member of the team. They'll provide you with the purpose of the ministry along with pertinent information. You'll be able to sign up right then and there, or you can go home and pray about it and see where God leads you. Or you can pray all week long and ask God to guide you to the ministry that is best suited for the talent that he's already given you. We have lots of talent in this church, as evident with the tea yesterday. Uh, there's some super talented people in the pews. Next Sunday is the fourth Sunday. That's usually a dress down Sunday. So ladies, you can wear your comfortable shoes. Men, you can ditch the ties if you like. We'll give you a bite to eat that'll carry you over until you get home. Lastly, we're required to serve and serve humbly and in love. Not only does that please the Lord, but it also helps you. If you're down, serve. If you're waiting on a breakthrough, serve. If you have everything you want and need, serve. No matter where you are in life, the Lord will give you joy or he'll restore your joy or just continue to help you maintain your joy. The joy that serving brings can't be beat. I could get on a soapbox about this, but that's for another time. Sometimes the work may be a little hard, but the benefit is rewarding. As Pastor said last Sunday, we have work to do, and it's time to get on post. Get on the job, do it well, and serve in excellence. So I hope to see all of you there at the Ministry Expo next Sunday, immediately following service. You don't have to stay long. Just come through and just find where God wants you to work. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not strutting. I got a twisted spine, so I'm not strutting. Just want you all to know. 
Good morning. First, giving honor to God, who's the head of my life in everybody in their prospective places. Those of you that don't know, I am Lillian, Lil, Sister Pinkney Parker, whichever, and I've even been re renamed the Silver Fox. All right. <laughs> but anyway, I am here to represent Seniors on the Move. And as Terry said, we have some talent in this church. Now, I come to you to sell you a ticket so you could come hang out with the Seniors on the Move that's presenting this blast from the past. What is the blast from the past, Lillian? Old music, 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, that's a lot of love songs that they don't have anymore. And we still remember, and we're going to sing it. Now, we're not professionals. You will laugh, we will laugh, we will crack up, we will cry, whatever. But we're out here to have fun. We're going to have a little dancing. So if you see Lillian doing a twist and get down and can't get back up, come help me up slowly. <laughs> if I'm doing the jerk and the arm gets stuck, come in. <laughs> OK? All right. The tickets are $20 each. I will be selling it back in the vestibule. The committee members have um, tickets also. Committee members, please put up your hands so they know who y'all are. OK, thank you. And um, if you are interested in participating, you have to be 55 and older. You have to come through me, which is fine. If you don't have my number, ask. Mostly everybody has it. I don't want to announce it online because then I'm, you know, uh-huh. And <laughs> anyway, but anyway. I hope you all come out. You will have a blast from the past. We did it before November. And the church people begged us to do it again. So we're doing it again. And thank you so much. God bless you all, all and hope to see you all on May 4th, right in the Life Center. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Uh, as said, my name is Michael B. Moore, and I am running to represent you in Washington in the United States Congress. Um, before I get started, let me just say I, I have an opportunity with this campaign to visit churches all over the state, and what a special place this is. Uh, this is wonderful. I, I've appreciated the warm welcome. Um, by way of a brief introduction, I will just tell you that professionally, my background uh, is in business. I've run companies and organizations. I was CEO of a company called Glory Foods. Some of you may have heard of Glory Greens. Um, and then I was founding president and CEO of the International African American Museum here in Charleston. Uh, we raised the money and got that institution stood up. And, uh, and then I let a museum professional come in. Personally, um, I am a proud son of the Low Country. My ancestors got here in the early to mid 1790s, and I've had family here ever since. Um, some of you may know the story of my great-great-grandfather, Robert Smalls, who as an enslaved man seized a Confederate ship and sailed it with his family and the other enslaved crew and their families and sailed it to freedom. In 1868, he was elected to the General Assembly in Columbia, and then after that, he served five terms in the United States Congress. I have the really profound honor that I am running for the same seat in Congress that he served in. And so it's just a very powerful thing. As you can imagine, Robert Smalls was a huge inspiration for me, but it wasn't just him. Uh, if I'm elected, I'll be the fourth in the last five generations of people in my family to serve in elected office. We were just hearing about service. Uh, my family just understood from the earliest moments that you've got to roll up your sleeves and try to create the world that you want to live in, that you've got to serve your community, serve others. And so that's what uh, we'll, we're, we've been doing. Um, I have, a, again, a unique opportunity to continue the fights that my ancestors started, fighting for civil rights, for voting rights, for social justice. Unfortunately, there are still a number of those battles that need to be fought and need to be won. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time who, in one way or another, need to have a government that works and that works for them. It works brilliantly for the 1%. Over the last few years, the 1% created twice as much wealth as the rest of the 99% combined. That's wrong. That's immoral. 
Uh, my interest is to serve the working families of South Carolina, to make sure that they've got someone in Washington who has their back, who is representing them, who's advocating for them, and that's the highest and greatest uh, aspiration for my life right now. I will tell you, uh, June 11th is the primary. It's an extremely important date. Uh, our community has an enormous amount of political power, more than I think we realize. If we come together, uh, our community can decide who goes to Washington. And so June 11th is uh, just very, very important. Um, and, and please, uh, please vote. Um, I am going to, I've got to excuse myself for a minute, but I'm going to come back and, and meet you all uh, after church. But it's, it's, it's been an honor to be here, and I look forward to engaging with you. Thank you so much for the time. On Saturday at 11 a.m., Zuri, which is my granddaughter, Simmons will be uh, funeralized, and it's at 1. I never heard of them before. Low Country Mortuary. At Low Country Mortuary, 11 a.m. And piggybacking backing on what Mr. Um, Michael said, I would like to encourage you and you encourage others that they will come and get registered and vote and help the young people to realize that this is a critical time. We, if we do word of mouth and let them know, explain what is going on because truly God will put the right person in the, in the chair, but he will also want us to do our part. Not everything, well, the Lord will have us with, he will, but he sent us out as servants. Amen. Now the choir will sing, and then the, as the ushers come forth, please give whatever God has blessed you with, to put in the basket. We have five ways, of, well, several ways of giving. One is through Cash App. The other is PayPal, Give a Fly, online. You can mail it to the church or bring it by. The church office is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 3.
Lord, we thank you for this offering, Lord. We thank you for those who gave, and we thank you for those who didn't have to give. We ask that you bless them so that they will be able to give in the future and help us to use this money for the upkeeping and building of your church. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to live so God can anywhere. should be the desires of every Christian heart that God if he need to use us no matter what the situation is where he want us to go that we are willing to do and we are willing to serve praise the Lord and past the sermon last week he talked about being a servant that's what we are Live so God can use you. In other words, you can't live any old kind of way. But you got to live the life that God has ordained us to live on this earth so that our light will shine in a dark world. It needs to shine now more than ever. When I was a little girl, they always talk about how things are so bad. But every, every year, it progresses even worse. So we need to pray and live that life that God can use us anytime and anyway. Amen. I also want to remind you about Pastor um, Anniversary, which is the third weekend in May. Please remember to get your tickets for the banquet. Amen. Amen. And so right now, as the choir sang the sermonic hymn, we're going to present to you for the speaker of the day, Reverend Warren Hill, Warwick Hill. So listen and hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Amen. I'm burdened 
Yes, he cares when I'm all alone. And he cares when I'm in misery. Oh, he cares. He cares for me. And he cares when I'm discouraged. His concern is so earnestly Said I know that my Savior cares He cares for me Oh, said I know that he cares
Father. Let the church say amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Has it been good to you? Amen. Hasn't he brought us from a mighty long ways? In spite of all the things we have dealt with, he was always there. Some things we thought it was the end, but some way, somehow, he brought us out. I'm glad I don't look like. What I've been through. Thank God for a forgiving heart, forgiving those who have done things to us. But we remember what Christ did to us on the cross. Repeat after me, Lord, forgive me for my sins and my unknown sins. Forgive me, Father, for not forgiving those who have done me wrong. Bless this service. Bless my heart. Don't let me leave here the same way I came in here. In your son Jesus' name. Oh, bless his name. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the Lord gonna speak to you today. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We give you honor and praise, Father. I ask you to illuminate this place with your prayer spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, let your word go forth like never before. Save your people today. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. We thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, when... Uh, First, I want to give honor to God, who's the head of all of our life, to the pastor and his wife and their absent, to all the preachers of the gospel, to the officers, members, and visiting friends. May God bless you and heaven continue to smile upon you. Uh, when Dr. Murray called me and uh, asked me would I speak this uh, day, You know, when you got a lot of stuff going on at one time, kind of make you get puzzled at times. And uh, man, what a week. But God brought us through. Notice I said God brought us through. And I was uh, talling on what to bring forth to you, and uh, we were taught that in pastor school to always pray and seek God because God knows what the house need. Amen. Amen. You know when you get on the plane and before you take off, before they get you on the runway, they always tell you a few things. And 
uh, one is they tell you to pull your seat up in the upright position. And uh, next they tell you to buckle your seat belt. And then third, they tell you to turn off all, yeah. And right before you take off, the steward stands in the line and she's, she, she holds up this magazine and she tells you how to pull your oxygen mask down in case emergency. But they say something that I don't think people often hear. They say, put your mask on first. Then you can assist your neighbor. I want to talk to y'all today for a few seconds about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, from the book of Acts, the third chapter, 1 through 10. And I'm going to talk on the subject, it happened on the outside. Uh, that's Acts, the third chapter, 1 through 10. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother wound was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask arm of them that enter into the temple. Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an arm. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them exceedingly to receive, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took, his, took him by the right hand and lift him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all of the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. God bless you. Jesus has come, he has served, he has trained, he has talked to his disciples, he tells them these things will take place, they are now in the fulfillment of what Jesus said will take place. In the first chapter of Acts, the eighth verse says, but he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And he shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaritan and the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, you cannot do the work of the Lord 
without being full with God's Holy Spirit. Nothing will happen until you get connected to the Lord who makes it happen. And whether you believe this or not, all of us in here sitting right now need a breakthrough. All of us in here, whether you want to believe it or not, has been dealing with something in life that you have made a part of yourself. When in true, God wants you to be free of all things that can upset you. That's why he was so long with the disciples, training them and teaching them and doing things in front of them and, and telling them that is, you can do this because of God. With God, all things. Oh, help me, Lord. Isn't God good? Oh, bless his holy name. It's God that does the work for his people. It is God, the one that see us through every task. It's God that woke us up this morning. It's God that started us on our way. It's God that got us out of that trouble that we got in that nobody knows that we got into. You know, church folks like to come, dress up, look good, and act like they got it going on, but if the record really be told, If it had not been for the Lord, we all would be in trouble around here. We must do it the way the Lord say do it, because if we do it the way the Lord say do it, then not only are you going to be blessed, but even those your neighbors, and those that you help far and near, will be helped. Uh, Jesus told the disciples, that the day was coming that they were going to crucify him. But he told them that he would come back alive. And then when he came back alive, he told them, said, I'm, I'm not going to leave y'all comfortless. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm not going to leave you to deal with life situation by yourself. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit that shall live in your heart and will tell you the truth. Now, uh, nobody, a lot of people don't like the truth, but everybody want to go to heaven. Well, somebody said, well, Jesus is coming back. Yeah, he's coming back, but he ain't coming back now because if he come back now, who are you going to take with him? Oh, Lord Jesus. The reason why he did so much in front of his disciples, because the day would come that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and they would be able to do the same work Jesus did and greater. And here we are in the book of Acts. Really, to be honest with you, the book of action. Because from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 28, you see nothing but the move of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of the believers. And God promised that he would take care of his people. He promised he would come to our rescue. And here in the book of Acts, he's doing just what he said he would do. If God wanted us to suffer the way so many people are suffering, he wouldn't have gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us that Holy Spirit so we would be encouraged in our Christian walk that God is with us. He's still with us. The Holy Spirit is God living inside of the believers, making things happen for us night and day, even when we're sleeping. The reason why you didn't get robbed is because of the protection God placed upon you. And God fights for the believers. Make ways out of nowhere. 
Don't ever talk about somebody else's problems when you got your own problems. Never put somebody down when you have faults yourself. Never think God can't bring somebody out when he has brought you out. Don't forget about those that are in the streets because a lot of us was in the street until, well, some of us out of the street because we couldn't handle the street no more, but uh, don't forget where you come from. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. Don't forget your neighbor. Because if you read this Bible, technically, we're supposed to be helping one another. Didn't the Lord look out for us? So here is Peter and John, one that is friends with Christ, one that uh, has worked close to Christ, done what the Lord told them to do, just like the Lord told them to do it. And when you do what the Lord tell you to do, the Lord can use you in different positions because he knows that you're going to do what the Lord say to do. So Peter and John is very ex uh, experienced disciples, experienced apostle, because they followed what Christ told them to do. And here on one particular day, on their way to prayer, here they came across a beggar. And Peter and John did not do like most church folks would do. They did not pass the beggar by. Uh, but on their way approaching, and the beggar put out his hand of giving, or receiving rather, Peter and John focused on his need. Now, the Bible says for 40 years plus, people brought him to the gate. 40 some plus years dealing with the situation. But one day, deliverance came to his rescue. And Peter and John was equipped to deal with the mission. You can't help nobody get to the Lord unless you know him for yourself. Uh, you know, Peter was a trip, but the Lord worked on him. He eventually came around. And God used him in this hour. Listen what the man said. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask arm that them that will enter into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, Ask for arms uh, on their way to prayer. So I let you know these guys were guys of prayer. And every leader and every man and every woman should have a prayer life. Everybody ought to have a prayer life. So when they came up on them, Peter fastened his eyes upon him and with John and said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. 
but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter didn't have what he was looking for, but Peter had something better. Something that could get him out of what he was in. The saints of God got to do better than just having membership. We got to have God's word in us so that when we're ministering on the outside and ministering to people, we can tell them of God's word and God got to honor his word. See, Peter told him to get up because Peter believed in healing. He had the faith. And when you have the faith and believe in God, that faith transfer over to the person you're dealing with. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. We can talk about people some kind of way. We could be on Facebook talking about folks. We could be in the community talking about folks. But isn't it funny how we have little time for prayer? Isn't it funny how we have little time to pray to the Father? Spend time with God. Oh, Father. So here Peter is ministering to a man that's in need. And the Lord honors what Peter is doing. Say what you want to say, brothers and sisters. We got to get on the move. The church got to do better than what they're doing. We got to learn to stop talking about one another and start helping one another. Stop doing what we're doing and be a helping hand. You know, we good at, uh, what's that word I want to use, Holy Ghost? We good at sizing people up from the head to the toes of their problems. But what about giving them a helping hand in their problem? And notice that Peter helped him up from where he was. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to help one another, we got to make a difference in their life. And the only way we make a difference in their life, you got to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Told him before they could even be his witness, told him, said, now look, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't do God's work. You can't do mission work. You can't do nothing for the Lord unless you're filled with his Holy Spirit. When you're filled with God's Holy Spirit, now you become an instrument that God choose to use. So here they are there. And the Lord moved upon them because they had the right attitude. They didn't leave the man there at the gate. The man problem became their problem. They didn't sit there and talk about him. Uh, they, they had a compassion to help him. You know, sometimes you can be bricked down on the road. And one time back, police officers used to stop. No, no, no offense. But uh, they, don't, they don't stop no more. I think some of them just as afraid as some, some of y'all. You know, you don't know, you don't know what you're going to run up into. Yeah, but when you got the Holy Spirit, he protects you. Yeah. So here I come help on the scene. Forty years of coming to the door, but nobody inside had enough God to take him on the inside. Left him on the outside. And here I come two of God's people, two of God's real people. See, when you got the Holy Spirit, you real. You can help people. You can tell people a word. I'm going to stand out there next Sunday. I'm going to speak a word. on Everybody coming in the door. I'm going to let God use me. I'm going to stand out there. I'm going to speak a word and let you know that God is real. God still love his people. God still got your best interest. God looks out for you when man won't look out for you. Well, I got to go. Gave you about 10 minutes to work with me. You look like you're just looking at me, so I got to go. But he got up because of God. He got delivered because of God. His, his life got turned around because of God. Because God promised that he would take care of us. Promised he would come to our rescue. Promised that he would fight our battle. Promised that he would turn things around. The Bible say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. David picked it up and said, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Yeah, the Lord is helping us, making things work for us, turning things around for us. And what I like about the fact that the man just didn't get healed, but the man began to give God praise. Church, whether you believe it or not, some things you wrestling with now, all it takes is a praise. If you can break out in a praise, you move the hands of God. If you can break out in a praise, you make the angels dance. I said, if you break out in a praise, doors got to open. Peter was in jail and the angel came to him and said, Peter, get up and follow me. But while they were walking on the outside, the gates opened on his own. And when Peter got to the house of the saints, he knocked on the door. The little girl came and looked through the window and said, oh my God, told the people, said, Peter's outside. They said, you got to be crazy. Peter locked up, but Peter came out because the angels of the Lord came to his rescue. Let me tell you something, church. You got to have the Holy Spirit in order to do ministry. You got to have God on the inside of you. Can I get a witness? You got to have God who made the heavens and the earth. You got to have God who said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You got to have God that said, let it be light. And there was light. You got to have God that asked Adam, Adam, where are thou? You got to have God that asked you the question, is there anything too hard for God? Can God do it? Can God bring you out? Can God turn it around? Can God deliver you? Can God let it rain? Can God do it? I believe he can do it. I want to go sit down. But I hear the Spirit say, stand up there. I got a word for the body. I got a word for y'all. that just sitting there and thinking nothing is going to happen. But the Lord says, fool yourself if you want to. The man got up. And until you get up and trust God that he can break you through, you'll just be sitting there sitting in your situation, sitting in your misery, sitting in your whatever. But God want to heal his people. God want to bring him out. God want to show you a new way. Yes, he does. Oh, Lord. Yes, he does. And when I get finished telling you about the Lord, I hear the Lord say, it ain't that I can't help those people. I'm waiting on those people to help themselves. That's why, that's why you're in the situation that you're in. Give me, a, give me a mic, give me a mic, give me a mic, give me a mic. I don't normally hold a mic, but give me a mic, give me a mic, give me a mic. That's why you're in the situation that you're in. You think you got it all together, but you messed up, jacked up, and you looking at your problems day in and day out. The Lord want to bring you out. The Lord want to sanctify you. The Lord want to use you. The Lord want to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. The Lord, Lord help me. He want to do it for you. I know the Lord will make a way out of nowhere. I say, I know the Lord will make a way out of nowhere. I know the Lord will fight your battle. I know the Lord will see you through. I know the Lord will rain on you. I know the Lord will send angels all around you. I, I know the Lord can send the help 
that you need. I hear the Lord say, keep on talking. A few more of them gonna stand. Cause I'm gonna tell you some things they're going through. Yes, I am. I hear the Lord say, the reason why you won't get in a relationship, cause I'm still working on you. You can't be with somebody when you need help yourself. I hear the Lord say, stop talking about your family members when you got problems too. I hear the Lord say, stop worrying about what they're doing on the job. If you trust me and never doubt me, you can use my word that says no weapon form against you shall prosper. Can I get a witness? Y'all help me close this thing out. He wants to help you. He wants to change you. He wants to wipe away your tears. Come on, church. Help me just for a minute. Won't God do it? Won't he come to your rescue? Won't he fight your battle? Won't he pick it up? Turn you around. Place your feet on solid ground. Oh, won't he do it, church? Won't God do it? Won't God fight for you? I hear David says, don't worry when Goliath was messing with God's people. God gave me the strength to stand against the lion. Can I get a witness? Goliath said to David, are y'all crazy? Bringing a little boy to do a man job. But what they didn't know about David, David was called, David was anointed, David was chosen, the Lord was with David. Yes, he was. And because the Lord was with David, David told the giant, the God that I serve gonna give me the head off of you today. And didn't God do it? Didn't God slay him? Didn't they win the battle? Jo uh, Joseph, 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 Joshua, thank you. Joshua. The Lord said, now go before the Jericho wall and I'm going to give you the victory. All they got to do is give me praise. All they got to do is give me praise. God said, I'll do it. Oh, bless his name. The altar is open for prayer. You don't have to take it back with you. You don't have to take it back with you. God want to do something in the life of his people. He wants to help you. He wants to change your attitude. Church, look around. It's happening. We're in a storm. But God got you protected. Come on. Bring it to the altar and leave it there. You can't fix it, but God can. He wants to turn things around for you. He want to make it happen for you. Thank you, Lord. You waiting on the Lord and the Lord waiting on you. Don't let the devil defeat you. Come to the altar and say, I'm gonna leave this, what I'm dealing with right here at this altar. I've been trying to fix it myself and it seemed like nothing has happened. I'm gonna bring it to the altar and I'm gonna leave it here. Uh.
Thank you, Lord. Eternal God, we thank you and we bless your name. God, these that are standing here at the altar, God, turn it around. Bless them like never before. Bless them coming in and bless them going out. God, what they're dealing with, let it stay here at this altar. Give them a new life. Give them a new path. In the mighty name of Jesus. God, we thank you. We bless your name. Realize you didn't have to do it, but you did. God bless everywhere. Bless those that are watching. Bless this community. In the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless your name. In your son Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. The doors of the church is open. Amen. The doors of the church is open. Is there one? Praise him. Oh, His name is Jesus. Jesus. Bless his name. He's worthy, he's worthy. Thank you, Lord. From the right. Slow. Absolutely. And another thing that he is also worthy for is you see these children on Sunday morning? Praise the Lord. Give God a hand clap. We just thank him for what he is doing in the lives of our children and in children's church. Thank God. God knows how to fix it. Praise the devil. Praise the Lord. The devil thought that he had to stop the children from coming to church, but God reached out and brought them back. Amen. I thank the Lord for the man of God, how he let God use him. Praise the Lord. We got to be servants. And in being servants, We got to have a clean heart. We got to be washed and be able to be set aside for the work of the master. God is talking to each and every one of us. We don't know the minute or the hour that the Lord shall call for us. Look at the little three months old baby. We don't know, but we also know that God wants us to have a pure heart, clean heart toward one another, to love one another as he has loved us. Praise the Lord to keep one another in prayer. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. And he gives us what we need when we need it. Amen. Some, people say it may not come when you want it. 
but he's always on time. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Now, if there's no other thing to be said, on the 30th, instructors training on the 30th of this month over in the Light Life Center, praise the Lord, at 7, 7 p.m., the 30th of this month. Looking forward and seeing you there. We all need instructions. And we need to learn the different positions in the church and what it requires and how you are to perform in those positions. Amen? Amen. So let us stand. Let everybody say. Let everybody say. to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the Father. Now as we leave this place, but not the presence of God, may the love, peace of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>